we are covering this story from all angles. And in my opinion, one of the more interesting angles in all of this is, of course, John Jones taking a fight on relatively short notice, around three weeks notice. And, and how do his coaches feel about this decision? Because as we recall, a few years back, UFC 151, John declined to fight on short notice. And uh, there were some uh, some words thrown towards, in my opinion, one of, if not the greatest MMA coach of all time, uh, some, some disrespectful words. And I wanted to get his take on on what went into this decision, why they're doing it, and the past week, and a whole lot more stuff as well. So we're being joined by the aforementioned greatest coach of all time, Greg Jackson. He joins us on the phone. Greg, how are you? I'm all right. I'm not even near the greatest coach of all time, but uh, I'm doing all right. <laughs> One of, if not the, I feel very confident in saying that. I appreciate your time. Wow, what a week it has been for you and the team with regards to John Jones. And, and I'm curious what the decision was like, like, how did you get to this decision? Because I'm always so fascinated about, you know, your, your thought process. John finds out and you find out that DC is out and then they're working, they're offering Anthony, they're talking maybe Rashad and, and they settle on Ovince. Why did you give John the green light to take this fight? Well, it is about timing. It's about how much time do we have to prepare John in the correct way to, uh, to fight who we're going to fight. So um, OSP is actually a very dangerous guy. He throws re- beautiful straight lefts. Um, he, he's, he's a dangerous dude all the way around. Um, but uh, I think we have enough time with a good three weeks uh, to uh, to get John uh, up to speed and, uh, you know, prepare him to, to fight for, I believe it's an interim belt now. Yes, the interim but, belt. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th- I felt that we had enough time. It's, it's a case-by-case basis. The thing about combat is, in gladiatorial combat anyway, uh, you can't make hard and fast rules. Like, this is always going to be the rule at this time. There's always exceptions. There's always, you have to kind of play the situation as it unfolds to try to make the best decision possible. So um, I felt in in this situation, my advice was, you know, I think we should have a green light for that. Now, the final decision is always John's. Of course, he's the guy getting in there. So uh, that was my advice, though. That being said, do you feel a little uncomfortable with this whole situation? Do you wish he had a proper training camp? I mean, this is part of the evolution of the sport to a degree, and I think you've spearheaded that. But the idea, you know, when someone falls out of a fight and everyone's like, all right, let's throw in this guy, let's throw in Mark Hunt, let's throw in that, it's a little too, it, it actually, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It feels a little too rock'em, sock'em robots. Given the fact that you have three weeks, do you feel comfortable with that or are you a little uneasy? I'm all, you know, it's my job to be uneasy. I always say, <laughs> I'm, of course, I'm uneasy with it. Dave, they're throwing, um, we have a nice planned out uh, scenario and they throw a little uh, X factor in there. So we just have to adapt, but uh, uh, we'll get them up to speed, I think, by then and uh, work hard and, uh, you know, be ready to go. But yeah, it's definitely not my ideal situation. But, you know, that's life. Life throws you curveballs. You just got to kind of figure out what you're going to do about it and uh, what decision makes sense and then kind of follow that decision through. So. Of the options thrown out, as I mentioned, Rumble was the top choice from what I understand. Even Rashad's name was thrown out. OSP is who they settled on. Um, did you like this option the best? Uh, for me, it's, it's kind of all the same. It's much more about timing than opponent. I mean, obviously, uh, Rumble or Rashad uh, is uh, a bit of a, ch- of a challenge, but I think OSP is, is, I don't think you should sleep on him. Um, he, I think he's got that, that straight left, and that thing, that'll knock anything down if it hits it the right way. So, um, the, it, it's more about the timing than the opponent, but they're all dangerous. I wish there was a super easy fight in the UFC, but there isn't. Uh-huh. Everybody's so tough. Um, so it, it's much more about can we get John prepared mentally and physically. Physically is not going to be a big problem because he was already in camp, but mentally switches gears, a completely new game plan, watching the tape that it requires for John to get comfortable so that he can perform uh, the way he performs, uh, you know, all those things. And I think we can do that in the time allotted. Speaking of tape, I had the privilege, as you know, of, of visiting your new facility over in Albuquerque, Jackson Wink Academy. It's beautiful. We, we did a, an awesome video, and it was such a cool thing. It was such a privilege to be there. And I got a chance to see your, your office, and you got that TV there, and, and everyone's telling me how you love to watch tape. And there's these sessions, especially with John. He appreciates it. I'm wondering, uh, 48 hours or so after the announcement came out that he is now fighting OSP, have you had a chance to actually sit down and break down who OSP is as a fighter? No, I mean, of course, I've watched him uh, for a long time, so I have a, a general sense, but we're going to get uh, into the micros here and in, in today. Okay. Um, I had a, a very busy weekend, <laughs> but uh, today was the uh, today we'll be sitting down and kind of breaking it apart. What'd you do this weekend? 
Oh, you should ask Cowboy. I'll just say, <laughs> ask Cowboy what we did this week. Oh, my God. I mean, a, a million things just popped into my mind. Um, is this there fight related, go. or are you, like, are, are, you, are you riding bulls no, in the air, at, jumping out of airplanes? Something like that. <laughs> okay. I will have to ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Cerrone. Um, if this was yeah. a week out, is it fair to say that you would have suggested no? I would have suggested no. Yeah, it's uh, it's very close. Um, I, I think with a we, with a couple of days of real solid uh, kind of reprogramming and then uh, just execute, execute, execute. I think we should be all right. Um, but yeah, if it was closer, I mean, for me, it's right on the line. Um, if it was closer, and John's a little more as he becomes more and more experienced, he's more and more adaptable. So that's another factor. Is um, he's had some fights uh, that that have gone long, have gone short, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but every time that you get a long five, five rounds or whatever, uh, it, you become more adaptable and more experienced. So that's the other factor is that I think he's better at adapting than he used to be. I would obviously be remiss if I don't ask you about the past week. Um, are you concerned at all with where he is at mentally? He's been through a lot in the last seven days, uh, more so than you know any fighter before a big fight like this. Did you have a chance to sit down and talk to him and sort of gauge where he's at mentally? Yeah, he's really focused. Um, you know, that... The, it was an unfortunate situation uh, with everybody kind of being at fault a little bit, you know, uh, but ultimately the responsibility is John's. Um, so it was a, uh, it's a bad situation, but uh, he came out of there really focused, uh, really positive, And uh, that's the thing with John, as long as he's razor focused, he, he's, uh, he's a force to be reckoned with. And he's really focused right now. So um, I, I think I, it was not a very good thing, but um, he's not physically injured. You know, he doesn't have anything uh, wrong. He, he just, he made a mistake uh, and uh, maybe said, said, said things he shouldn't have. And hmm. uh, it was, yeah, it was just a bad situation all the way around. Um, and uh, uh, he got in trouble, refocused, came out. So that's the, that's the part I like is that he's focused. Um, he's got a driver now, so everything should be fine. Oh, is that a full-time thing? Is he is he not going to drive? For oh, yeah. The, okay. Is that important yeah, for you? I mean, yeah, he's, yeah, you know, it's just, yeah, I just want him to focus on fighting. That's what he needs to worry about. The rest of the circus, he needs to not be uh, distracted by. He's a warrior, and he needs to focus on that. When you say it was everybody, like everybody had a, a part in this sort of, um, this breakdown, if you will, this this unfortunate situation, who is everybody? Who who are you including? Do you include yourself in that as well? Uh, well, no, it was just an unfortunate situation. John wasn't really drag racing. Um, the officer involved uh, thought he was drag racing, and so that es- instead of de-escalating that situation, uh, they gotcha. both kind of escalated it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I would have I would have liked, to, especially John, just saying, uh, you know, Instead, John, you know, he's got a lot of pride, and somebody jumps on him, and he's going to jump back, and uh, it just escalated to where I thought it didn't need to go. So, uh, you know, maybe de-escalating stuff would have been yep. a little bit nicer, but, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, whatever. From your perspective, how has he been up until this point? I mean, you know, like, we, it's cr- he's been, because, you know, he hasn't fought, as you, I don't need to tell you, but he hasn't fought since January of 2015. We all know what happened in April. Then a little mishap, you know, a few weeks back with the, with the speeding, and now this. I mean, how has he been? Is it? Is, is it true? Is it accurate when people say he's a different man? He's more focused. He's so. Is all this stuff true? That is true. Um, however, he's still, you know, like he shouldn't be driving. So we got him that. That's fixed now. Okay. Um, and, you know, later on, I think he'll be able to relax a little bit and uh, not be as intense. He's a very intense guy, and so uh, you know that translates to every part of his life. But he's definitely focused. Um, he's definitely uh, been training harder than I've ever seen him. So I think that year off really, I, I think it kind of helped him out. He's just, he's really focused. He's really, really uh, intentful. That's the word I'm looking for. Okay. That word even exists. It's <laughs> I nice get you. To see him this way. Is it surreal? Like for me, just being a media guy who knows him, it's surreal to see him, you know, with the orange jumpsuit and all that as his coach and friend. What's that like for you when you see him? Like one day he's in the gym and the next day he's there. Uh, well, I grew up in a place where most of my friends were in and out of there all the time anyway. So it wasn't a, it's not a big deal to me. You know what I mean? I'm just, I just don't want him to be there longer than he needs to, but it's not, um, it, it was part of my culture growing up. So it's, it's nothing shocking. for me. Okay. Wow. I don't know if I'm supposed <laughs> that is crazy. It's shy. I guess I'm, I'm, I think I grew up in a bubble. I think that's what I've learned as I've grown up over time. No, not at all. I mean, there's people in, listen, there's this myth that like if you're from the hood you're the toughest dude in the world like biggest cockroaches i ever met lived in the hood and you know there's these like white goofy kids from the midwest that are bravest toughest guys you ever met 
Right. Ever. So it, it's all about the individual. Like sometimes you, you have a better, a different relationship with violence if you're growing up in, in certain parts of this country, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're like tough or anything like that. Did Greg Jackson have like, did you have like a tete a tete with him, a sit down, just mano y mano? And, you know, cause I, I always view you as a sort of like Phil Jackson type of figure. I don't know if you're familiar with Phil. And, and your your principles are basketball coach. People yes, have called me Phil before. So I know your principles are different, but you have a, a very similar demeanor as as far as coaching is concerned. In my opinion, did you kind of figure? Do you, do you have to like sort of sit down with him after something like this and figure out where he's at and, and, and navigate those waters? Did you do that at all? Is that necessary? Uh, it's not too necessary. Just sitting. I mean, he's a grown man. Um, yeah, it's sitting down and making sure that he's focused and that he can do his job and that uh, you know. Maybe to to uh, get a driver would be a great idea. You know these kind of things we, we've suggested. So, but you know, John, he's he's his own man. He's gonna. That's the way I always treat my people. They treat me with respect, and I treat them with respect. Um, I can suggest to do things, which I do, but I I'm, I don't own anybody. I'm not like um, I think there's like this whole myth of the martial arts master that like tells you what to do at every part of your day. And that's, I'm definitely not that guy. Okay. Um, I try to teach students. You know don't be an idiot. Um, <laughs> and, uh, some, some take to that better than others. But, uh, so I do, I, I definitely do like, you know, think decisions through components to the way I teach. But I mean, these are grown men. These are, this is a sport. It's not like I'm teaching my martial arts and my martial arts school is very different that then we're teaching values. We're giving you power. So we need to teach you values. This is a sport. So while we try to give them values, they need to also, you know, like, it, it's not a. It's not conducive to a martial artist to be bragging and saying he's going to beat everybody up. But it's hugely conducive to selling pay per view and stuff. Mm. So a lot of that is uh, is not in my like in my teaching in my style. I would not do any of that. Right. But uh, you, if you do that, you sell money and or you sell the event, and so that helps out too. So there's there's different uh, different fighters take it different ways. But uh, for for my fighter fighters, they're their own people, and uh, I can suggest things for them. But that's about it. Considering his layoff, are, are you expecting some ring rust on the 23rd? I don't think so. You know, um, I wouldn't be surprised either way, but uh, I don't think so. I think he's training hard enough where he's, and he's got some good sparring partners where he can just get right back into the flow. Okay. Um, by the way, what's it been like, on a quick side note, what's it been like, I get a kick out of seeing BJ Penn and all these pictures and seeing how your fighters are rea- reacting mm-hmm. to just having him there. It seems like they, they really enjoy yeah. um, him being around, and he seems to really enjoy being a part of the team. What's this been like for you to have him around? Uh, it's just a lot of fun. You know, BJ is uh, hes actually a very thoughtful person. Um, he's very intelligent. Uh, so having him around, he's, you know, he's an old vet. And uh, I wouldn't say old. He's a vet. But uh, uh, it, it's just nice to have that energy in the school. He, he brings his own energy. Um, he's a very caring person. And uh, I, I just we just like having him around. Like everybody on the team adores him. So uh, it's a very positive thing. We have our, The morale is really high. It's, it's a packed school at the moment. But yeah. Uh, the the team morale is really really high and that's that's a good thing. Are you confident that he will fight? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think uh, once he gets through his personal issues, um, we're going to be uh, we'll be ready and uh, hopefully, if we've done our job right, he'll come very prepared. And he's staying in Albuquerque until he fights, right? Because I think that's important. I think that's it. Wow. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that uh, we want him just focused here, constantly improving, learning new stuff, new new uh, ways of thinking, new thought patterns, these kind of things. Also, while I have you, um, how difficult was it to watch what happened to Holly? So close to winning, or at least the draw, remaining champion, and then that happening. What was that like for you, considering your relationship with her? Well, yeah, you know, it wasn't. It was no fun. I mean, that's part of the game, though. You know, it uh, it uh, it certainly was not an enjoyable evening. I'll put it that way. But yeah. uh, you know, we recover, we learn, we grow, and we move on. So, uh, Holly's an incredibly mentally tough individual. So she's taking it in stride and training hard, and uh, uh, she'll be right back at back at it. Um, she's lost before on big stages. Yeah. She's, come back and won again. So I'm not too worried about uh, Holly. I was actually, I was very sad for Holly, I was, but I wasn't angry. Like, I was mad at the judges when they uh, gave uh, Lawler the decision over Carlos. And it was a close fight, but I thought we had that. Yeah. Uh, that one I didn't react well on. But with Holly's, I was like, well, you know, she's really just figuring out the ground game now. It takes a while. So I wasn't, I wasn't too upset. I do remember seeing you after that Carlos Condit fight. And I don't recall, you know, having the privilege of being back there, seeing you that upset after a fight. Um, and, and, and who knows? I mean, do you, do you really think that this or that was his last fight ever? Because he has said if he doesn't get a title shot, he's going to stick to that. And that was a couple months ago. What do you think now? 
I don't know. You know, he's uh, he's coming by the gym and saying hi to everybody. But uh, that honestly might I don't know might be it might not be. Um, he might have changed his mind. But uh, uh, certainly, um, I think a rematch would be in order for that one. Yeah. Uh, nothing against Robbie. Robbie's a good friend of mine. I love him to death, and he fought his heart out. It's not his fault. Uh, but uh, I thought the judging was a little askew that night for sure. So he comes to the gym, but he's not really working out or training these days. He tra- you No, know, he trains, but it's not. He's not fight training. There's a whole different. That's a whole different world. You sure. can be in shape, and then there's being in fight shape. Two different things. Um, does does do you want him to keep fighting? I, I want him to be happy. So um, if you want, if make, fighting is making him happy, then I want him to fight. And if not fighting makes him happy, then I don't want him to fight. That's it. <laughs> uh, I feel like I ask this question every week, and just two minutes left, and then we'll let you go. And thank you again for the time. But you know, GSP. Do you think he comes back? I honestly don't know. I mean, there, I, I don't know. You'd, uh, you'd have to ask him. Um, certainly, he's a great guy and, and a good fighter, and I'm sure he's got a few years left in him if he wants to do it. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's all the way up to him. But as for me, I have no idea. Has he talked to you about it? No, no, we haven't sat down on it um, at all. Uh, I've talked to uh, Faraz a little bit, but uh, haven't sat down with George on it. Okay, and finally, how awkward is this uh, this Overy Marlovsky situation for you? I know you're not a fan of this. Yeah, it's just you know, it's just a pain in the butt. It's all part of the job, but uh, it's and we have protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody's been very cool about it, but uh, yeah, it's just it's just not fun. Are they it's, ever? No part of that is fun for me. Are they ever training in the same gym at the same time? No, we have them at separate times. Okay, and, and, and what about, like, like is Overeem going to have any of the coaches with him, or is he bringing in his own guys? Because you guys have yep. said that he's bringing in his, his own guys, right? Wow. No, he's, and some, no, no he's, he's got some of his own guys and some of our coaches, too. Wow. Um, is this the first, is this the yeah, highest stage? Works. I know you, you stepped out when Carlos um, fought GSP, but for you personally, is this the, the highest stage where you've had to corner a fighter against another fighter of yours? Yeah, probably. I would. I would. Nothing comes to mind. Although I'm famous for forgetting stuff, but uh, <laughs> off the top of my head, I would say yes. Wow. All right. So you're just you're just hoping for that day to come and go and and move on, right? Yeah. You know, that's all I can do. All right. All right. Um, well, Greg, I appreciate the time. I know how much you love doing these interviews, so it means a lot that you would uh, <laughs> come on the show and 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 give us some insight. I was very curious to hear your perspective on all this. And I wish you guys the best. It seems like you have, you know, eight fighters on, you know, uh, every weekend and every different card out there. But in particular, April 23rd, since we focused on that, good luck against Ovin Pru. Looking forward to it. I will see you out there. All right. Thanks, brother. All right. Th- there he is, Greg Jackson, stopping by. Interesting to hear him say that John Jones, as we joked about last week on the program, now has a full-time driver. And I think that is very important and uh, a huge piece of news, um, not to undermine anything that he's doing, but look, you're, you're that close. There's so much riding on it, and every time John has gotten in trouble, it's been you know it's been related to cars. So why not play it safe? Get a nice. Remember last week I said get a Rolls Royce, get something like that, get a sweet ride, chill out in the back. Do what you got to do and just be safe. Get your money, get your belt back, do your thing and, and, and leave the driving to someone else. I think that's a great call. And kudos to him for actually agreeing to it. Kudos to the team to you know, finally do it.